faculty member here at the, at the Graduate School of Architecture. Um, and we're here to, to celebrate um, the vulnerable anniversary of the 40th anniversary of, of Roe v. Wade. And as we know, um, this is an issue that comes up um, every election. And although 40 is not you know, a number of any significance that we can really attribute anything specific to, um, we thought it was really important to, to bring this issue um, to, an to an architecture school. Um, so we are very thrilled to welcome Merle Hoffman. And um, she has been working really on this issue since 19 1971. Um, and I think, you know, I don't really need to describe all the incredible things that she's done, but she is the, um, the president and founder of Choices, which is, uh, which, um, which she'll describe sort of how, how it all came about. But I think the most important thing to say about her book, which I highly recommend everybody reads and is at the back of the room, called Intimate Wars. Um, the Life and Times of the Woman who, who Brought Abortion from the Back Alley to the Boardroom. And I think in, in some ways that really sums up why, um, why we've invited you into, into a school of architecture, not just because um, you moved from a very dangerous, you know, a very dangerous place where things were dangerous um, for a woman's body, to become um, the president of a for-profit, Corporation, um, which stands for um, health of, of, of a woman's body, which I think, and you, you talk about that a lot um, in your pub public um, presentations, which I think is a really great model of entrepreneurship for our students, that you actually can have um, a business out of very urgent issues, you know, that, and, and that's something that we should all really pay very careful attention to. Um, and Rebecca Gompertz, she is um, actually one of the few people I know who's both a doctor and an artist. And she also happens to be a friend. And so when Gavin Browning, where's Gavin? <laughs> Our amazing events coordinator at the school, um, actually suggested, um, he, he was the one who suggested the, the topic for this debate um, tonight. And he said he really wanted to see Rebecca Gompertz and Merle Hoffman talk to each other. So I'd, I'd followed the work of Merle for a long time, but I was you know, really excited to, to know that Gavin knew about Rebecca, not that he, not that he shouldn't have, um, because she's done amazing work, which is, which is really different, but has a, has a lot of um, overlap with what, uh, with what Merle does, um, and blends a kind of social activism with contemporary art, with media politics, and she'll describe um, two versions of the project that she's done, which um, on the one hand is using uh, space in a very creative way by putting boats in extra, uh, extraterrestrial, extra, extraterritorial um, <laughs> boundaries. <laughs> we were talking about Mars before. <laughs> yeah, you know, 12 miles, <laughs> 12 miles off of any, um, any shoreline of a, of a country is actually international territory. And so Rebecca um, very bravely uh, brought these boats, uh, which had an abortion clinic on them, and then would bring people from uh, countries where abortion is still illegal into these boats, which uh, provided um, safe abortion. But that wasn't really, th those were in some ways symbolic projects um, and really made it very quickly into, into the media public attention. Um, but since then, she's actually shifted her, her project. She still does some of these ship activist um, things, but has um, moved her project really to womenonweb.org, where um, she distributes um, abortion pills to anyone who, who wants them. Um, and that can actually cross international borders much more, much more freely than boats. <laughs> And so it's a completely, I think we're talking about two completely different um, territories of, of space. And I think that these are very well um, described by the questions that Gavin um, sent to both Rebecca and Merle when he, when he sent out the invitation to them. So how have you encountered or engaged with design in your work? This is a question to both of them. In your experience, how has design, and Merle, perhaps 
in your case this is about building code, um, serves to enable or hinder access to reproductive health care? Um, how does political and social environment affect the need for care? And how do the environments that you create address these specific needs? Um, the conversation does not need to be restricted to brick and mortar facilities since we're interested in your case in the use of media for visibility and social change. I guess it goes without saying that this is held to mark the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade in the US, and that's an important benchmark for where things are with reproductive health care in the USA today. Although, you know, these are two incredibly um, well-known women who uh, work internationally. So I'm happy to introduce Rebecca Gompertz first, um, and she will give a 10 to 15 minute presentation, and then Merle will give a presentation. And then I also want to introduce uh, Hilary Sample, who's a, a colleague here at the school, and uh, one of her specialties, she has many specialties, is um, healthcare, public health, and architecture. Okay, thanks. I think this has to shift to the other panel to do this. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Misoprostol can be used for a safe abortion, for the prevention and treatment of heavy bleeding after giving birth, induction of labor, and treatment of incomplete miscarriage. This pill can save their lives. Make sure all women can get it. and about politics. And while Viagra, for example, is very easily available everywhere, um, and there's a lot of resources spent in order to get Viagra in the hands of men, uh, abortion is um, very difficult to get. And this was actually a, a campaign that we made with footage from Hollywood movies, um, um, to, um, which is a parody on the Viagra, more or less on the Viagra um, commercials. So. Uh, if we look at uh, abortion, um, I just want to first give you the context. Um, the context is the abortion is illegal in um, um, around the world, and you can see the red and the orange countries is where abortion is illegal, and the green countries is where abortion is, is legal. However, um, it's still one of the most performed medical interventions in the world, and even in countries where it's illegal, uh, women have abortions. Um, 21 million abortions per year are illegal in countries where it's illegal. And as a result, 47,000 women die. It's one of the main causes of maternal death worldwide. But it's not only legal um, uh, restrictions, but also economic and geographic circumstances that restrict access. And that is something that you can see, especially here in the US, uh, where, for example, now in Texas, there's hardly any abortion provider available anymore. Um, in Dakota or in a lot of places in the Middle East, there's the women have to travel for hours in order to find a nearby clinic. Uh, and also the cost for an abortion are often so high that a lot of women cannot afford it. Uh, we get a lot of emails from women here in the US and it's getting more and more and the situation is really getting uh, harder and harder for a lot of women here. So one of the things that uh, happened uh, 10 years ago is that um, medical abortion was introduced. Um, and that has been a revolution for women because 
there's two, okay, there's two ways in which it can be done. This is described here. There's two different methods. Um, but the bottom line is it's the same as a miscarriage. So women can do it themselves. They don't need a doctor to give it to them. Um, it is especially in countries where it's illegal, where women can take charge of their own lives again. And it's extremely safe. So it's very similar to natural miscarriage. Women don't die from natural miscarriages. They die when they do abortions themselves in countries where it's illegal with sticks, knitting needles, poisons, jumping of stairs, and all kinds of uh, violent methods. Um, the abortion pill has a very low uh, risk. It's safer than penicillin. It's safer than Viagra, uh, for sure. Um, and it's safer than giving birth. One in 10,000 women dies while giving birth in the Netherlands. Here it's higher. And if you look at the mortality of a medical abortion, it's less than one in half a million, and that's here in the US. So uh, Women on Waves um, was established uh, more than 10 years ago with the idea that uh, we would help women in countries where abortion is illegal. And um, what we do is we look for the legal loopholes, the legal spaces where we can do it. And we have a couple of, um, um, a couple of strategies. One of them is with a ship um, that Laura already explained. With a ship, you can go to international waters. There, it's the Dutch law that applies on board a Dutch ship. And women can take the pill there, and then we sail back. This is um, a photo from our campaign in Portugal, where we were actually stopped from sailing in uh, by warships because the Minister of Defense said that we were a threat to national security. Um, but as a result, um, there was such a big political debate that abortion was legalized there two years later. Um, this is footage from our campaign in uh, Morocco. <laughs> Met by angry protests and blocked by warships, the group's first attempt to dock at a Muslim country has failed. Pro-life campaigners shout terrorist and assassin at activists from Women on Waves. I think Moroccans feel this is a provocation. They have to stop and I think all Moroccans would agree with me on this. The ship is a floating hospital that provides family planning advice and contraceptives. It also offers early abortions carried out in international waters. Terminations are illegal in Morocco, resulting in hundreds of backstreet abortions every day and sometimes death. Well, the boat is, is a, can uh, symbolically help a few women. We can sail out to international waters to few, help a few women. But what the boat mostly does in this case is that it really tries to call attention to the fact that there is a medicine available here. The campaign group is used to being unwelcome. It's met opposition in Catholic countries such as Poland, Spain and Portugal before. For now, its way into Morocco is cut off by the authorities and its message largely unheard. But the okay, so. That is one of the legal uh, loopholes, the use of the, um, the international waters. Um, a couple of years ago, we started an online service called Women on Web, uh, and women can do an online consultation, and the medicines are sent to their home address. Um, and that is actually, at this moment, it's the most, that, that is the service which is most, that has helped most, most women so far. Uh, and it's helping women all over the world, in the Middle East, in Africa, in uh, Asia. However, one of these medicines that you can use for medical abortion is actually available in some of the countries, and I refer to it in this uh, in the small clip about Morocco, and it's called misoprostol. Um, and we trained local women's organizations uh, to give information about how women can use this medicine themselves. And so there were uh, safe abortion hotlines were set up in a couple of countries, and the way that uses the legal loophole is the legal loophole of the freedom of information. While abortion is illegal, it's the freedom of information that provides the, the, the possibility to give information on how women can use it themselves. Uh, and these, uh, these um, hotlines are now kind of um, also providing a lot of help to women around the world. Another um, place, what we're trying to do is try, try to change the framing of the debate around abortion. Um, and this was a campaign that we designed together with uh, the Yes Men, uh, where we were pretending to be Diesel, the fashion brand, launching a new campaign uh, called Misopos Misopolis, where women had the, um, the women factory workers had the right to have an abortion. 
um, and we developed this, um, and it had a, a huge response in the in the fashion press. Um, but what we also try to do here is kind of uh, occupy the language from the anti-abortion group, so that's why we say abortion pills a gift from God. Um, another uh, space is the virtual reality space. This is the augmented reality. We had a, we developed an augmented um, an app where uh, it's the use of an app which is called uh, Juneo, and we launched these banners uh, in front of all the uh, cathedrals around the world. Uh, this one is taken in front of the Vatican, um, so it's augmented reality. It's a virtual reality banner. Um, and in the end, of course, it's all about women. So these are what some of the testimonies that we have from women that used Women on Web, um, where the difference between having a clinic and the control of being able to use an abortion pill yourself is so um, um, uh, present. For example, it's the moment of privacy in my own bedroom, um, full control over your own body. So it's this difference between control by a doctor versus autonomy of the body of the woman herself. Um, it's not as difficult. It's, the, it's this privacy, that the privacy of your own body versus the public space that is the, the clinic. Um, and we think that uh, medical abortion, um, will, it really changes women's reality to access to abortion. So we work, we, every work that we do is to try to make sure that there's l bigger access to the medicines and to the information how to do an abortion yourself. So it's the do-it-yourself movement of abortion that starts again. Thank you. It's the 40th year of choices, actually 41st, and we'll be moving in here March 2nd. You, you go into a room that's misty, dark, clouded, and then through your own eye, your own vision, you start to create clarity and spaces and areas and colors and rooms and movement. And this absolutely was a dilapidated old building just as my previous space was. But that's the exciting thing with creation and with architectural creation. So uh, I love that process. gorgeous. The uh, community is uh, definitely one that needs our services and I'm very excited about coming here. We were forced to move from the 12th floor down here. It is a basement. It's damp, it's dank. This is going to be so much better. I mean, uh, actually, I, I was in that previous space with an anti-abortion landlord for almost 15 years. And this is the... And look at what I got behind me. This hallway is normally four foot wide. Frankly, this at this point is too narrow to be code. But there's construction going on. 
problems with no heat in the winter, no hot water in, in my office. I mean, we're, we're just ongoing. We used to have all kinds of educational, it was a patient educational supply. Items, you know, like this, but a lot more that we've had to move around. It's so good to be in a beautiful, new, uh, clean, sparkling, a space where uh, everything works, or at least it does now, but I would expect that it will. <laughs> to buy my uh, first white uniform for my job with uh, Dr. Gold, who I eventually married, and with whom I started Choices. So it's, it's a strange thing, as if the circle has turned all around. And uh, the other part about Jamaica is that it's almost like a third world country in the middle of New York. The teenage pregnancy rate is 35% higher, the prenatal care is problematic. There are many uninsured people, so this is an ideal place for choices to, to be. We're going to do the, uh, the same services that we've been providing uh, for 40 years, uh, which is family planning, abortion, gynecology, prenatal care, uh, counseling, HIV, sterilization, all, all reproductive health services with the mental health component. And as we get involved in the community, we will, of course, take their input in what services that they would need and they would like to see and hopefully work those in. This is the first full day of Choices, of the new Choices. I'm very excited. This is uh, a beautiful, beautiful facility. We've worked many years to create it. I was on a, um, a trip to England where I was asked to address the all-party parliamentary committees from the House of Commons and the House of Lords on population control and sexual and reproductive health. And uh, it seems that there is what is called an Americanization of abortion politics going on over in England where the antis are beginning to use the same sort of tactics that they're using here. So I spoke to them about strategy, about tactics, and about the fact that this war on women is basically a global one. And interestingly enough, I come here today in New Choices, and we have an extraordinary demonstration outside of our, our doors, uh, very, very visually uh, violent and propagandistic. I'm not surprised, because I thought that they would welcome the patients who were trying to make a constitutional, moral, and legal right to choose, um, and make them feel harassed and guilty and shameful, which is what their uh, usual MO is. I am committed to be here if 
the fates allow another 20, 30, or 40 years to serve women the way choice has always had. For, uh, for inviting me and having the vision uh, to have this discussion. Um, and I'm very, very uh, honored to meet Rebecca. Uh, she's one of my heroes. <laughs> she has a, a wonderful heroine and pirate on the seas, which I, aside from being so brave, is very romantic. So thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, if we talk about space, and uh, abortion, I think uh, the last four decades of my life uh, have been spent in codifying and strengthening the basic space for women's freedom and women's liberty, which is her body, because this, this is the body politic. And without the freedom and the ability to choose when and whether or not to be mothers, we cannot be full citizens of this country, nor can we be full individuals. This is the last space, what you just saw in this uh, video. Uh, this is the last space that I built, and I think we're going on the second year in Jamaica. But if uh, I look back in 1971, uh, when I was 25 years old, and uh, a uh, student in social psychology, I serendipitously got involved in providing abortion services for HIV patients, and it was in a small group, and we put cots up in a hallway and used the examining room. And after a few months, we were able to move, to, to upgrade to the basement of another HIV group. And um, in this basement, uh, there was a large room, it was the recovery room, and there was uh, my desk and three or four beds, and there were exam rooms, and uh, this is where uh, patients, uh, patients would come. And I, I have to say, and it was in Flushing, that was the, uh, the, first, uh, the first iteration of choices. The first patient came from New Jersey, and she came from New Jersey because abortion was illegal in that state. And we are moving now, and I think uh, Rebecca had referred to it, and we all know to a situation where abortion, if it won't be illegal, it will be impossible in many, many states. So this woman came from uh, New Jersey, and uh, there was no such thing as counseling, as any kind of protocol. Uh, this was a whole new world, a whole new universe. So the space had to create the reality, in a sense. And uh, I began to counsel her or talk to her, which was the evolution and the beginning of abortion, quote unquote, counseling. And uh, really, it, it was holding her hand and connecting with her that catalyzed me and was the epiphany for my realization that this had to truly become my life's work. So we stayed in the basement, and that was uh, in Casino Boulevard. All of this was in Queens uh, for about uh, seven years. And many, many patients would come. And uh, I began the evolution of my philosophy. One was patient power, and how did this come? And patients would come, and, and they were pregnant, and say, well, my doctor told me to go off the pill and use foam. Or my doctor said, I didn't have to refit my diaphragm after I you know, gave birth. So of course this was not true, this was misinformation, and these women ended up pregnant with unwanted pregnancies and, and having abortions. So I began to call that iatrogenic pregnancy. In other words, unwanted pregnancy caused by the misinformation or lack of knowledge of physicians. And I started to think very deeply about how could it be, how was it possible that I could change physician behavior. You know, I, I told uh, uh, patients that they should take uh, little uh, tape recorders in with them to the doctor's office, take a friend, 
so they wouldn't get too anxious. But then I realized that really it had to come from the patients. And it was a revolution, what I called the reluctant revolution. The patients had to become aware, had to become empowered. So I conceived of what I call patient power. And I had tenants, the patients have a right to question their doctor. The tenants have a right to know the affiliations and the education of their physician. The patients have a right to see their medical records. Things that seem you know, very logical today. 40 years ago, they were very radical. I actually created a visualization, a poster, with uh, a concept of God as, uh, you know, uh, God. Doctor is God, <laughs> sometimes they're interchangeable. With thunderbolts and the patients uh, underneath holding up these placards saying, we have a right to ask questions, we have a right to second opinions, we have a right to know. Okay, because it's all about the concept of knowledge. There was no our bodies, ourselves, nothing. So very slowly those concepts started to grow. Um, after, after a while, and I developed the, the, uh, the programs developed organically, uh, patients would come in and, and they would see a counselor who was at that point a facilitator and say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I want an abortion. And then we'd say, well, of course, you know, we'll have to refer you out for prenatal care. But I did not want to refer patients out, so I decided I had to get an OB on staff and deliver prenatal care of choices, which I started about 30 years ago and which is still going on now. So um, the concept is sterilization. We also did vasectomy, so the, the whole full service. The idea of interdisciplinary medicine, where the physician basically was a technician and all of the other emotional support of educational concepts were from ancillary staff, ancillary staff. Um, I outgrew that space, and then I moved into a 9,000 square foot space on Queens Boulevard, owned by Samuel Lefrak. And in the beginning, he was very proud that I was in his building, uh, but uh, shortly thereafter changed because, because of all of the demonstrations and the issues and the problems, I actually had armed guards guarding me for three months who were sent by Janet Reno because of the killing of Dr. Gunn and the threats of the people around, actually around choices. But we were seeing at that point in time almost 20,000 just abortion visits a year. 20,000 abortion visits a year. Um, basically, uh, I was thrown out by Samuel Lefrak. I could not renew my lease, and because we couldn't hold over, he was threatening to bulldoze the space. So uh, fortunately, fortunately, I found another building, which was in Long Island City, uh, and I moved into there. That had about 24,000 square feet, and the women kept coming. They always kept coming. Um, about six months after I moved into that building, it was sold to an anti-abortion owner who spent 14 years of my being in that space trying to constructively evict me. What I was talking about there, you saw some of the administrative spaces there. No heat, no hot water. I have somebody sitting here tonight, Joy Silver, who worked with me during those years, and I have a, a, a visualization of Joy sitting outside my office with a hat and her little gloves because she was so <laughs> committed and it was so, so cold. So we were, we were in Long Island City for, um, for all of that time. I, I want to tell you a little bit uh, of what happened, one patient's story. It was uh, a Russian patient. We saw a lot of Russian immigrant patients and this woman came in and uh, she was in for her 35th abortion. Um, now, very, very little shocks me, as you can imagine, from where I sit and where I work. But I was absolutely shocked at that. And I went up to my office and I sat down and I thought, what can I do to change the world for Russian women? How can I help Russian women? And I picked up the phone and I called Joy. We figured out a way to go to Moscow. And really, we're trying to open up choices, uh, what I would call choices east. Uh, and at that time, the former Soviet Union. I mean, people were getting shot in the lobbies of the hotels. It was, it was very wild, wild, wild uh, east. Uh, unfortunately, I could not establish the bricks and mortars, bricks and mortars of 
choices, but I did establish the idea. I, I established the concept, and I know I set the spark. So uh, that remains for someone else to do, or uh, for, for some other time. So um, I think that's, uh, you know, at this point, we're, um, we're in Jamaica. We're expanding our programs uh, almost exponentially. Uh, I like what you said about uh, entrepreneurship. You know, when I was in Russia, I, I talked very much about capitalism with a conscience, you know, which, was, uh, which is, I think, very powerful. And uh, there's this feeling that, that there's almost a, a negativity about uh, profit. But if profit is, is uh, made honestly with integrity and it's used well with a conscience, I think it can do a lot to, uh, to change things. So thank you. So let's talk about capitalism now. <laughs> <laughs> With a conscience. <laughs> yeah. well, what is your What is your website? Um, do you make? Is there any money that comes to you out of your website? It's yeah. a non-profit. Uh huh. But uh, we ask women. So it's actually quite an interesting uh, model because we ask women for f uh, for a voluntary donation. Um, and um, it's uh, 90 euro normally, but of course a lot of women cannot afford it. And so then there's a kind of a process of negotiation. So women that can pay less, they get less. But the women that cannot afford it, they get it anyway. So about 15 to 20 percent of the women get searched for free. Mm -hmm. And the women that give the, the 90 euros, they basically pay for the other women. Mm -hmm. But sometimes women give more because they are really grateful for being able to access the, the surface and they give solidarity donations. But I find it really fascinating because there's no way you can really actually check whether somebody has the money or not. So it's really based on trust. And the whole service is so much based on trust because we have to trust women that they provide us with the proper information, how long they're pregnant, that they're healthy. Um, and they have to trust us that what they get is really going to help them solve their problem and that the information that they get, that it's true. And in the internet, of course, it's the Wild West. So there's a lot of websites also there that are you know, selling fake medication, and a lot of women are taking advantage of. So um, that's our model. Mm. Yeah. So it's very Marxist socialist. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, yeah. actually, actually, we have more in common than you could imagine because I've never turned a patient away, and it's my ability to have, you know, funds, excess yeah, funds that, that that can subsidize. Yeah, it's the women that, that can't pay. And you know, what, what is ideology when you're talking about women's life and women's health? I know, I know, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. It's an issue mm. among mm. feminists, it's an issue, you know, and... Uh, yeah. Well, you, you have, you, know, have some, you mean yeah. money is an issue? Yeah, well, money is always an issue. Um, no, no. <laughs> it, it's especially way, now. <laughs> especially now. No, it, it's basically the way um, it's perceived. You know, we I just spend um, more money, and you can always use bitcoins. I um, am a radical. I'm a feminist. I'm an intellectual, and I'm also a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 combination has been uncomfortable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with it. Some people aren't. You, you, um, you actually have something else in, in common, the two of you, and Hillary, you can ask a, a question, because um, in the use of uh, design and, and activism, the, the coat hanger as a, as, a, as a symbol of reproductive rights that, that you uh, yeah, invented yeah. really did become a kind of universal uh, uh, symbol. And, but Rebecca actually um, does it does it another way, like with a very specific, um, with uh, very specific media that she uses as a 
as a as a as a site, not so much in terms of you know just uh, letting an image fly around the world, but you know using the yes men on the one hand and um, websites on on the other hand. So it's just I, I think maybe you can talk to each other about that a little bit. Ah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the coat hanger, of course, has been a, a, a super important uh, symbol. It's become the symbol of the un right. unsafe abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, well, what I what I find also interesting is that for me, when I I mean, I didn't I don't come from the like a tra traditional feminist um, tradition. I was just a doctor and you know ending up to be abortion provider and becoming an activist. And um, for example, the word choice for me, like pro-choice and reproductive health, they were so so foreign and so I could not relate to that because um, uh, it's it's a very Americanized kind of concept of, the, for example, choice. Uh, for me, I've, and I've seen a lot of women for, for whom an abortion actually is not a choice. It's just a decision they have to make because they're in a certain situation where they actually cannot make, where they don't have a choice. So I, I find it, very interesting for me. That was a very interesting moment for me to to learn more about the American situation and how language was being used. And uh, and I think what we have been trying to do with the Yes Men is actually also to bring in humor because it's all very serious and very. And we're trying to lighten it up and to make it a little bit weird sometimes and a bit uncomfortable, like that you can, yeah, to try to change the kind of dynamic, the feelings around abortion and to normalize it more. It's kind of such a, it's become such a tense subject mm -hmm. instead of like a normal medical procedure. Mm. It yeah. isn't because especially in this country, you're dealing with a situation where seven physicians have been killed, two clinic workers, there's consistent harassment, there's consistent mm -hmm. um, economic and p political deprivation of, of women's rights yeah. going on. I, I agree with you, I'd love to laugh a little bit more, but unfortunately mm -hmm. the situation mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is far from amusing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think choice is a euphemism very often. You know, mm -hmm. There are many people who are uncomfortable with uh, saying, yes, I am for abortion. I'm for abortion if I don't want to have another child, if I can't, or you know, whatever the reasons yeah. are in that yeah. case. But, uh, but uh, I think the uh, anti, I know the anti-abortion movement has done such a, a superb job propagandistically in creating this you know, umbrella of shame yeah. that uh, even so many of the pro-choice groups you know, mm -hmm. have that same problem. And I, you know, I, I talk very often about if, if women themselves who have had this procedure don't come out, I mean, there really will be a, no possibility mm -hmm. of what you're talking about normalizing, mm. because that really has to come from inside. Yeah? Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. I think one of the things I was really struck by in your book um, was the, and, and even today in your presentation, the sheer numbers of people, whether of women, um, whether coming for abortion or just also now your clinic, which seems to be expanded in mm -hmm, education, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you've really built, you know, it's both a kind of uh, making and unmaking in a way of the world, if I use Elaine Scarry's sort of concept, but this idea of, of um, you know, normalizing or maybe habit, which is the thing in a way that the, the idea of repetition and repeating, and in Elaine Scarry's book, in thinking in an emergency, this is really the, the kind of position I think a woman is, is facing in this situation of an abortion, in some cases, right? This emergency that's not, it's not a habit, it's not a daily thing. And yet you as, um, uh, in, in your, both of you, I think, in your work, it, it's <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, is it, it just, just the kind of thought about um, the kind of question of day-to-day um, -day or normal, the kind of habit, and I, I started to look up the, term of habit and it you know it leads to a kind of practice but ultimately practice is about a kind of act that's about repetition but it's also about choice and I just thought this was a very interesting sort of connection between things about being confronted with what it can be in a kind of emergency situation and yet on the flip side of that there are people such as yourselves who are able to perform uh, in, the, in this way to provide this other um, so I think that's incredibly powerful. And you do it through, and what I really wanted to get to is the, the idea of space and how, you know, Merle, for you, you talk about, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of this very small scale basement, right? 
And now, as you see in the video, obviously you are well out of the basement. And how is it that you, um, you know, can you sort of describe uh, the sort of evolution of that space and where you think it's going? Because I think there's also something about today, I would say the generation is, um, and me for, for me personally, growing up with, I'm as old as Roe v. Wade, I grew up with test tube babies, HIV, AIDS epidemic in high school, you know, so that there's this kind of, and today I think there's a whole other set of, of criteria that women are, are facing and going through, you know, the articles in the New York Times that, that dating is dead, you know, that there's a whole other kind of, of, of thing going on and what, what does that mean and what, can you make any projections for? Projections for uh, choices yeah. itself? Yeah, or no, in general. I mean, maybe the kind of trends or, you know, in your book you talk about and the first clinics had uh, purple and red furniture. You know. Mine, yes, <laughs> yes. <I do. laughs> but that was before the uh, regulators came. And, uh, you know, um, if I was 12 miles outside of the mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. waters, I wouldn't have to worry about you know, the width of the corridor, how many feet are you know, between each bed. Um, I, I have, um, uh, okay. Hello? Uh, yeah. I have a, a real concern about the, uh, the future. I look at what's happening with reproductive health, with uh, the uh, politics around abortion, and uh, it concerns me. It concerns me that there's not a massive uprising, because there has to be. I mean, the, um, the anti-abortion radical right in this country, as I say, is very effective, mm -hmm. very strategic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we have some of, uh, yeah, so we have Wendy Davis that makes a speech for you know, seven or 10 hours. That is not gonna make the difference. What makes the difference is every single woman and the people involved with her who have experienced this mm -hmm. have to come out of their own closets and support this right and that will normalize it until or when that happens, we are going to see more and more chipping away. Uh, I also um, have always been amazed about why there's not a enough work in coalition uh, with the civil rights uh, organizations, with the gay and lesbian organizations. You know, I mean, this does require, this is a fundamental human and civil right, reproductive freedom. And it really does require that kind of massive uh, proliferation of action. So I, I, um, I see a lot of young people who are very involved, obviously a lot of uh, social media activism, that's very good, uh, you know, the, uh, the mesopristol and the, and the medical abortion is only good up to a certain amount of weeks. I see we provide that at Choices. It's a self-selecting population. There are still many women who don't want to have the privacy of their home, who don't want to have the abortion that way, who want to go in and have it surgically, go home and leave. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to have the availability both of the medical abortion and of the surgical abortion. Uh, now they're cutting back on the amount of weeks on the upper end. That's also concerning. I mean, uh, aside from a frontal assault, on row at this 40th anniversary, what is happening is that there's guerrilla tactics all around it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a great time, a great challenge for activism. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about the? Um, can you talk more about the f facilitators and the kind of spaces? I think that you you know you describe it's not counseling. You're very clear in your book. And like yeah. what you know is there something? You know, I think this becomes th these are problems of design and. Issues right, of security, right, even. Right. Well, in the beginning, uh, there was no, as I said, there was no counseling. There was no uh, concept of what one does uh, as a provider for abortion. I mean, one day it was illegal and a crime and immoral. The next day, women are lining up for services. So, how I learned is somebody, there was a patient there, somebody said, counsel this woman, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> counsel. Now, I, I was in graduate school for psychology. Okay, I'll, I'm game, you know. And I, I just spoke to her. And uh, it was that dialogue. And, and then I spoke to every patient who came in. Mm -hmm. And then I hired someone else who I trained to also speak to, you know, to other patients who came in. 
<laughs> so slowly, you know, as the field developed and as other facilities grew, you know, other other uh, providers also said and saw the, the the wealth of experience that that could bring to patients. I mean, they are facilitators to make the road easier. Uh, at this point in time, I have MSWs, but for many years, mm -hmm. there was no uh, credentialing at all because mm -hmm. there was just no credentials mm -hmm. uh, for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, may, yeah. I, may I ask you something? Because actually, I think the, the thing with counseling is, in a lot of cases, women don't really need to be counseled. They don't want to be counseled. They don't want to, they would just, you know, they know what they want. They made their decision. Right. So I think this over-medicalization and over-problematization of abortion, right. where doctors keep control of the procedure, where, you know, we feel that, that the emotional support is sometimes needed, but often it's for actually other situations than the unwanted pregnancy, but it's the whole social economic situation Absolutely. where women are in. Um, and um, so I, I think that w one of the things that we really want to do is try to totally demedicalize abortion and put it back in the hands of the women where it belongs. Mm -hmm. um, and that means also kind of being more um, open to women that don't want to be counseled. And just say, okay, it's their right. If they just want to have the abortion on their own terms, then they can have it. We do that. We yeah. do that. You know, but, but also, you know, we do take a medical history. And, you know, because we have to know, we give general anesthesia, so we take a medical history. Yeah. Part of that medical history picks up some depression, some domestic violence, some other issues, and we have to have consent forms signed. You know, once again, I live in a very heavily yeah. <laughs> regulated, no, very, yeah, yeah, yeah. regulated yeah. environment. Absolutely. I mean, when you, when you talk about counseling, sort of that classical thing comes in where I'll tell you what to feel and, you know, you really have a problem. That's not the kind of work that we do. That's not the kind of work that we do. I mean, if somebody wants to come in and not speak to anybody, that's fine. They still have to, you know, sign a consent and fill out a medical history. But, but now the reality in the U.S. is becoming more and more. Actually, for, for example, in Texas, women are importing uh, mifepristone from Mexico. Uh, and they're doing it by themselves. I think yes, that I actually the experience of women doing abortions by themselves here in the U.S. Is, is becoming more and more. So how do you reconcile these kind of two different realities? I, I don't think it's necessary to reconcile. Uh, I think that women who, why are the women doing it by themselves? They're doing it by themselves because they can't access a provider. And not only, not, Re Rebecca. But they don't want to yeah, access. Well, like, they do, they, maybe they want to access a provider for birth control and contraception. Maybe they want to. Maybe they want to have some birth control and contraception. Mm -hmm. You know, very often it's it's good to come into the to the system, or at least you wouldn't want anybody into the system, perhaps. But through contraception and preventative care, as opposed to getting pregnant and then looking around in Texas because there's no abortion provider, saying, "Oh my God, what do I do? Let me get online and get and get to uh, to Mexico, and get the pills." That's why they're doing it. They're not doing it because they sit down and say, I think it's better to do it online. I mean, it's because there's no access to anybody. I, I'm not sure whether that's, I, I think it's difficult to say. I think in some cases that will be the case. I think in other cases, actually women consciously make the decision that they don't want to go to providers for a lot of different reasons, that it's much more private. Women feel it's more private, it's more practical. Um, uh, they feel that they have a right to do it. So I think it, it's Fine. difficult to generalize mm -hmm. that. Of course, I think there should be access to regular abortion services. And that's the problem, that it's not the case. But I, I also want to make the, the case for kind of really deregulate, trying to also go with the de deregulation mm -hmm. as much as possible. I would support deregulation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Would. I, I want yeah. standards. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. want regulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any legal issues analogous um, to what Merle talks about in the clinics on in the online situation? Because you're talking about it as completely no, deregulated. It's of course, it's not, yeah. No, no. So no, we just no. I mean, of course, there's you, you, whatever you are, whatever you do, you have to adhere to laws that exist. It's just to fi try to find the right loopholes so that you can do whatever you want in the different jurisdictions, and it's basically what we do. But um, no, and and uh, there has been legal challenges. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's it's a constant battle to keep it up as well. Um, and I'm. So 
So if you're providing the, the pills on this Dutch website, it's, it's not Dutch. a Dutch. No, no, it's no, not so a what is it? So what, where's the... Uh, do you mind if I don't go into the okay. legal details? <laughs> Maybe we should um, open it up. Should we open up questions? Yeah. Should we open up questions to the audience? Okay. Anybody have any? But for example, if we talk about the ship, for example, we have a li there's now a court case uh, pending against women on waves as well. Yeah. Like we were uh, uh, by the Dutch government actually because they say we broke the Dutch law uh, when we did the Spanish campaign, and we know it's bullshit and it's really interesting when it would come before court. Um, but, um, I mean, the legal challenges are also a way to, um, um, it's an intimidation, strategy of intimidation, um, and it's a way of self-censorship, the, the uh, legal, the, the kind of the regulations and, uh, and legal frameworks, and I think uh, we should learn not to be afraid of those, but just to go head on and, uh, and let us be challenged in court. Well, then you have to trust your legal system. That's a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it's a problem in some other countries as well. For example, in, uh, in Portugal, when we were in with the ship in Portugal, we had a court case, and uh, the, the judge then said that they, that, uh, they overthrew our uh, request, and we won in the European Court of Human Rights because the court in Portugal was corrupted. Um, so it's, it, it's really strange how we somehow want to trust uh, the rule of law and uh, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Questions? Questions? Mm -hmm. And I am a counselor at Choices. Um, I think something that you both hit on, it, it, it's something we see, I think it's a bit of a false dichotomy how women like to have their abortion. Um, there are some women that feel more comfortable doing their abortion with a provider, and it's to be respected. Um, and there are some women that absolutely do not feel the need or the want to have others involved, and that's to be equally respected. Um, I think it's something that, that we work, or I know I work very hard during my sessions with patients, many of whom do not want to go through my door. Uh, in fact, our door says consult room and not social worker because otherwise nobody would cross it. Um, it's to make that hour how you want it to be. You, know, you don't have to have somebody ask you about your feelings if you don't want to. We're here for whatever you need, however you need it, whether you just want information or to have the forms explained to you before that you sign them to get in, to get out, to laugh, to cry, to handhold, to whatever it is. Um, I think it's just, it's a fundamental right. I think all of us respect and love you get to have, you should get to have as much or as little support and intervention as you feel you need in that moment. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that w when I started to, to think about these facilitators was, uh, again, what I talked about, the iatrogenic pregnancy, the amount of misinformation that women had from doctors, the inability to go anywhere to get any accurate information. You know, now, yes. If you want, you can research on the web, or you can, you know, look at the, the 20th iteration of our bodies ourselves. But it was it was the the language of the uh, the priests. You just couldn't break yeah. into it. It was like they were speaking Latin. So the the first thing that was so important for the facilitator was to say, okay, this is what an abortion is. This is what we're going to do. This is your cervix. This is, you know, so I, I found and I still profoundly believe in the importance of education and knowledge, and, you know, what lines. Can you talk a little bit more about your, about the location of the, I mean, I think it's pretty striking in the, in the video and then Jamaica? Your, your description, but specifically, I guess, the kind of street and the, um, Especially with this point about access to education, and in the video there was also a clip of the train. So presumably, you know, you're close to trains. We're very close. We're we're extremely close to to the subways, to every subway, to buses, to the Long Island Railroad, and uh, I believe they're they're building. Uh, they're going to have a subway that goes straight from Jamaica to the east side. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's very very. Uh, well suited in that respect, but what really also makes it such a very good place for choices to be is it's so underserved. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they did a couple of major studies of healthcare in New York, 
and came up with Jamaica as having so such a percentage of you know inability for the, for patients to find prenatal care mm -hmm. yeah you know we we have about 120 patients in our prenatal program mm -hmm. since we started and and the the no access to birth control i mean mm -hmm. people just come in to hang out sometimes in a way mm -hmm. i i really see it as an oasis in a sense mm -hmm. and um i know you could talk uh, carry a lot more about what we pick up in counseling, the amount that we see a lot of 11-year-olds, a lot of 12-year-olds, incest, and you know all sorts of awful histories. And we have wonderful ways of uh, liaising, liaising and, and connecting with other supports in the community. So we've really become a very integral part of the community. And uh, I find that very, very uh, rewarding, very rewarding. the first point of contact for some of our patients and some women is the contact that they make at the facility and at the clinic. They don't see doctors. This might be the first time they're actually having any kind of conversation about what's going on with their bodies at all. Right. It serves as the primary care. So we're getting a, if somebody, it, it's not that it isn't great to take a pill and do it at home, but that presumes you have a home. Mm -hmm. And that presumes you have privacy when you're at home and that it's safe to do that in your home, in the relationships that you have in the home. And we find that that isn't always necessarily the case. Yeah, but you can also advise people to do, kind of create these kind of situations. It can be also at a friend or in the waiting room of a hospital. I mean, it's not always kind of, situations are not always um, perfect, but it's also guiding people through that process, I think, to understand. Um, but I do, I do agree that it's very important, and, and I think that is also a very different context from where I come from in the U.S., where sex education here doesn't exist anyway, so right. it's true that a most women sex, don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> that happens a lot. So I think also, um, I think you, you, are, you see your role much broader than just being right, health providers, yes. and, and I think that for us it's kind of more limited to making sure that women have access to safe abortions and information about contraceptives when they need that. Uh, but it's, it's a different, it's a totally different model, yeah. Uh, both of you, um, we're thinking about design and the design decisions that surround your institutions, which are very different uh, physically, take very different physical forms. Um, and I'm curious, <clears throat> thinking about your role as advocates or activists, how you think in design terms about uh, visibility of your institutions versus, and it might be a question of scale, versus, uh, uh, or if you feel you're required to provide any kind of anonymity or uh, how you deal, I'm just curious, maybe at the level of the clinic, thinking about your patients if they want to uh, exist or um, be served in a sort of less, thinking about privacy versus your institutional role uh, as, as advocates for a cause. And I'm just wondering if, I, I, maybe that doesn't even resonate at all, but if there's any kind of conflict between uh, you know, serving a large public where visibility is important and serving individual patients where perhaps uh, confidentiality or, or privacy is important. Maybe that's not a conflict, but I'm just wondering, for me, that helps connect the discussion to design in a little bit more of a concrete way. So. For me, um, I see uh, the political work, the literary work as the theoretical arm of the movement, of my part in the movement, and choices is the provisional arm. So, I talk about, like this evening, uh, I'll talk about, I'll write about um, philosophy and the, the politics of what it means uh, to, uh, to have reproductive freedom. Uh, but the work, <laughs> that's every day. I mean, it's, it's every day and every patient that comes in and every micro-ethical issue. I mean, they, politically, the issues are writ large. In the clinic, you have them with each individual patient. And uh, that's when uh, the, uh, the rhetoric has to become reality. 
<laughs> my rhetoric has to be, becomes real. I have to live what I preach, in other words, and I, I do, I do attempt as much as possible. And again, I'll go back to when you talk about design, the regulations, and the requirements within those boundaries to express the philosophies of uh, care, compassion, dignity, um, respect. Uh, is it? I mean, at one point in time, I had. Uh, counseling rooms uh, that were semi-round because I wanted the patients to feel enveloped, you know, as opposed to these square boxes. Um, I couldn't do it in this space, so I, I uh, depend on the staff to envelop the patients. And that's what I started out saying, how this space not only is beyond the bricks and the mortars, I created, uh, you know, uh, the, the love and the concern with patients when I was in the basement in the same way that I do now. Um, okay, so the privacy issue, of course, is not an issue when you do it online because it's the, the patient data is, is protected according, you know, and, uh, and um, um, and and there, it's it's sometimes there's women that have dif difficulties, for example, to receive the package at their houses because they're afraid that their parents might know or an abusive husband or whatever, and then it's sent to a friend's house or you know we help them figuring out the process. The difference is with the ship, which is very visible, and uh, anti-abortion providers are saying that they are, will photograph the women. So the tactic that we developed there is that we have a large group of female volunteers that go on the ship as well. And then when they go on, they all put on a scarf and sunglasses, and so that nobody knows who is actually the woman who needs help and who's the women that are, you know, providing support. And that has worked very well so far. Um, and sometimes women don't want to be anonymous. They want to share their stories publicly because they feel they think it's very important. And uh, on our with Women on Web website, there's also a section where we actually ask women to share their stories in their faces because I agree with Merle that it's super important that women come out right. because it's the taboo and the shame that keeps it illegal uh, in the end. Um, and so there's a lot of stories there of women that share their experiences. And that's also a, 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 a big um, support for women that are living in countries where it's illegal, where they have nobody to talk to because they're so afraid. And, uh, and so they can read the stories of other women on the website, you know, on the process, how they dealt with it, you know how they dealt with the uh, secrecy, the, s the fear. The, the fear is enormous, especially in countries where it's illegal. You know, when a woman has an unwanted pregnancy there, there's, n you know, she can't go anywhere. She, she's afraid of her life. And so, and it's really important to, to realize that these realities are very different. Um, yeah. The, the difference between the ways that you're both talking about local and universal or local and, and global, because that, you know, just listening to you talk now, and you're talking about the countries in the world where abortion is legal and illegal. It's more um, you know, thinking about it like an NGO um, so that you can go anywhere. This idea can go anywhere in the world, and it might have to be addressed differently in a local way in, a, you know, in each local place versus um, Merle, who's, um, you know, the, the methodology in some ways can be taken other places, but would be very different. So I'm just, I'm just curious what you, what, I don't know how many languages your website is in, but I think that's what's really interesting, like the universalism of the way Merle is talking about rights versus the way you're just saying, well, anywhere in the world where, I'm, I care about every place in the world where abortion is legal, and that's a really great position. And then how you move forward from there, I think, is really complex. And that's what the website tries to do, which I don't think there are very, very many projects like it. Mm. Yeah. And so I think it's just, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the website is in 12 different languages now. And there's a help desk that is answering the questions from women all over the world in all these different languages, like seven every day. Uh, and it answers at the moment around 10,000 emails per month uh, from women all over the world in all the different languages about anything, but mostly related to abortion, but also sometimes just questions about sexuality that women are afraid to be pregnant. 
Um, so I think it's the biggest online help service for women actually that exists at the moment. I don't think there's anybody else that has to be. I think for me, the global, the local, I'm not so interested because for me it's not so much, about it. it's just really an, a need, an urgent medical need that women have. And there's, that is universal. And I don't see any local or uh, anti-globalist component to it. Um, uh, it, the, the situation might differ in, for example, a woman in Saudi Arabia is not supposed to be pregnant. So the advice that we have to give her, for example, when she takes the medicines, we usually say to women, if there's a problem, you can go to a doctor and say that you had a miscarriage. But when you're not married and you're not supposed to be pregnant, then you know you cannot go to a doctor and say you had a miscarriage. So these are the different local situations that we needed to learn in so order to give. Tell her? Well, I mean, what we tell her is basically like if what we are now learning is to distinguish and to help her distinguish the differences between really what can be a life and endangerment situation, which is actually super rare. It hardly exists. Um, so that she knows that she's safe, even if she has, for example, a lot of bleeding, that when it's not bleeding like a certain amount, that it's okay. Um, and that she can also establish the outcome of the procedure herself by doing a pregnancy test or also when the symptoms disappear. So actually women are pretty well capable also to deal with their own body if they have kind of the right information, the right mm -hmm. guidance. Um, and fortunately, medical abortion is so safe that it's so rare that there is a, you know, emergent medical, you know, medical um, emergency ever actually have never exist. But for example, recently there was a case in Iraq, a girl that um, had used only my postal. She was not somebody that we had received help from in the web, but she had asked for information. And she had to take the tablets in the hospital and they had found out. So she was put in the hospital, they took away all the pills from her and, you know, I mean, these are situations that we really don't know how to solve. but. Um, I mean, you must have these situations as well where you're kind of overwhelmed by the reality, where you know you cannot pro provide a solution. And I think that's also where our work becomes hardest. It's not where you can help the women, it's mm -hmm. where you are unable to help them, mm -hmm. which is the kind of the most frustrating, difficult, um, and, and challenging moments. Yeah, that's what teaches you humility. It does. Because there are times when, uh, you know, I know again with the counseling and especially uh, counselors who had seen the same patient come back again and again, and they come to me and they say, I'm so frustrated, you know, and I, I have to uh, talk about how much they can do and that their power is limited, you know, you can't, sometimes you can't change that life. No, you, you, know, don't. you Sometimes you can and you have to accept it. Uh, I think the, I think your project about uh, where the boats go to the international waters is extremely interesting. Uh, but I was thinking that do you ever get in, in a problem or motion, especially in third world countries, when you're trying to cross international boundaries and you're trying to dock at one of the countries? How do you get people on the boat? Okay. Okay. So actually, um, so so far we've done five campaigns with the ship. Uh, mostly they were in Europe. Um, and we have been able to help women on board the ship twice only <laughs> because in the other cases the ship was kicked out immediately or there were warships that prevented it from sailing in in the first place. So, But that is, I, I think that um, what we learned and that is why it, when we started in the beginning with Women Waves, it was really difficult because we really felt that we needed to help women because that was their only option that we had. And then when Women Web started in 2006, the ship was kind of, if, if the ship couldn't take women on board, for example, in Morocco, when we, which is the first, actually, the uh, um, country where there was no rule of law, basically, where we went to or under, uh, it was kicked out like two hours after we didn't announce that we were there, like, um, but, um, um, what did I want to say? Okay, so, 
the, now we know that there's another system that we can help women with. So even if they can't come to ship, at least now they have the knowledge that there is medical abortion, that there is a telephone number that they can call to get information and they can get it sent to their home addresses if they need it. So the ship in that sense has, has changed. It's, it's really changed from a, where we really saw it as sometimes the only viable option for women as a way to, uh, to, to create awareness and a public debate about illegal abortion, the situation in the countries itself. And it's, what is interesting is that the ship is able to generate so much publicity. Um, not, I don't know of any other campaign or action that is able to do that. Like the ship in Morocco was covered by, you know, CNN, Al Jazeera, like Arabic news agencies all over the world. It, it, it's kind of always, it's upsetting people so much that it's really a good way of, you it's know, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, did that answer your question? No, but we're thinking of drones. We saw, we, we were thinking about drones that can <laughs> drop the packages. <laughs> they, they need a little bit of a bigger, a bigger, yeah, um, wide, wide, uh, wider range. So, you know, anybody interested in? I like that. In? I like that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I wanted, uh, first of all, I appreciate both strategy that you know, one, mostly medical, the other one has some social aspect to it. But what I found interesting was when you mentioned that in the clinic some people just hang out. Mm -hmm. And I find that very interesting because I think one part of it is instead of looking at this experience as something shameful and let's just do it and never think about it, it might actually be the beginning of linking you to a whole different uh, organization or even through your organization, getting familiar with other options. You said like some women, don't have good conditions at home, or you ask them if they have like um, a violence condition at home, right, things right, like that. Right. So, did you have any cases that? Uh, Unfortunately, we we can't keep people overnight. Um, I, as I say, I see it as an oasis, but it's a, a limited one. It's more of a, <coughs> a psychological oasis, uh, and uh, the staff remains a, a contact to these patients. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, sculpture by the artist Linda Stein. It's a Wonder Woman all across the, uh, the side of the waiting room with very, very powerful messages. You know, if you dream it, you can be it. You know, you are all, all of that. And I also wanted to bring up art. I have uh, a lot of art around the, uh, the clinic, and I find that uh, both uh, its power and its ability to... Uh, to settle and to calm and to connect. Um, but, you know, um, people do come with the patients as significant others and they do stay and they do connect, but un unfortunately at this time we don't have a, uh, a place for them to stay over. Maybe two more, two more questions? Okay. Um, I was just thinking a bit about the sort of uh, the anti-abortion propaganda and the use of, of violent imagery and how mm -hmm. um, in sort of anti-abortion propaganda, the women's bodies aren't even sort of a site of violence as much as just like a staging ground for violence. And, and then the initial video um, that was shown as well as the kind of diesel ad campaign and the sort of creative use of, of images in both of those and was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, just kind of publicity and the, and the use of image in, in your work. Um, I think that, that um, so for when we started Women on Waves, for example, um, we ha asked Joop van Lieshout, who was a Dutch artist, uh, to design the mobile treatment room. And he was known for as a very misogynist artist uh, with very sexist uh, work. Um, and I thought it was actually quite interesting to work with him because of this kind of 
uh, Uncanny Alliance. Um, uh, and we always considered the kind of the visualization of, the, of our work, uh, work very important. So we had a very good designer for the logo. And, and I think we, we, that is what I'm interested in, is exploring all these kind of edges of what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and um, with the Diesel for Women campaign to say abortions for successful living, like it, because that is what the Diesel, uh, diesel uses this, uh, um, this the, the, these are the, their lines and we, we, we co-opted them. Um, and and I, I think that we need to play around with these edges in order to understand how we can change the, the framing uh, of, of abortion and to change the perception. And it might not always hit the right button, uh, but at least it puts you on the wrong foot sometimes. And I think that's very important. And that's what we also try to do with the Viagra, Viagra campaign, where um, to explicitly use male sex, sex um, uh, uh, in order to try to yeah, to, to reframe this idea about abortion. And I, I, don't, I cannot explicitly say why, what it is, what are we trying to achieve, but I think that the, the playing around with it is very important um, because otherwise you get so stuck in your own uh, um, uh, propaganda uh, and, uh, and you have to question that, the way you frame abortion. Mm -hmm. I just had one quick question, which was, uh, I, I've seen ads for choices in the subway, um, and they don't, they don't give an address, and I, it made me think about security as something that's part of the design or, or a consideration, and, um, and I thought maybe both of you could talk about that or address that sometime. Definitely. Yes, definitely. Um, we have very, very aggressive antis out there every Saturday. You saw a little bit about what they put up. But the connection of the Holocaust with lynching and abortion is by far one of the most egregious of their concepts and of their images. Uh, actually, um, I, uh, I was involved with, uh, at that point, uh, Quinn City Council president who did a, a press conference. Uh, I'm um, involved in a lawsuit because some of the antis actually surrounded one of the patients and put their hands on her, so that's against the face laws. So we have, you know, uh, a lot of these people every Saturday. We also have very, very effective escorts. These are uh, volunteers who come every Saturday and they assist the patients to walk into the clinic for what is a legal constitutional service 40 years after Roe v. Wade. So yes, I'm, I'm uh, sensitive. Uh, we put, a, uh, in terms of the imagery, we have uh, a wonderful woman's, young woman's face there. And it was just choices celebrating 40 years of women helping women. Now, most people know what choices is, and it wasn't necessary. I think we had our phone number or our website down there. Um, we have a very active internet campaign. Uh, I have my six-foot hanger that I held up in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral when we did the first pro-choice civil disobedience and nine people were arrested. I had to argue with Planned Parenthood and a whole group of pro-choice activists and organizations because they said, well, it's too depressing. It's just too negative, you know? I mean, nobody will connect. After a while, everybody's using it. Would I like another image? I would. I would like another image, but uh, at this point, we haven't been able to um, collectively come up with one. Maybe I'll get that misogynist artist you work with. <laughs> It'll help me. <laughs> Or the last word. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> Does anyone else have a chair? Okay. Um, yeah, I was just kind of wondering what you thought we could do as designers and as feminists to sort of promote the cause of safe and 
private care for all. I mean, all both of your interventions and your 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 work is very spatially oriented. Like, you, um, you chose either to locate in a already underserved neighborhood that you felt could really benefit from these services, or just being forced into international waters to provide this care. And then also in the light of the new legislation that requires higher standards from abortion clinics and makes them into basically surgical centers mm -hmm. and um, affects the bottom line of abortion clinics and basically puts them so they can't operate anymore. Like, um, what are some things we could keep in mind as architects and planners to promote this kind of access or at least not uh, take away from it? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I really, you're right, because all of the regulations now in 20 states uh, are requiring the kind, the stringent requirements that I operate under as an ambulatory surgery center. So when you design for a clinic, depending on the state, you're going to have to design it that way. Unless you can go, you know, to, to the... Um, to the places near the water and <laughs> design a boat. You know, I mean, it's problematic. It's problematic, but the, I, I don't see any way out of that at this point. I, <laughs> why did I go to Russia? Because I saw this patient who came to me for her 36th abortion. And she was about 35 years old. And I had seen patients who were there from, from Russia, Russian immigrants, 15 abortions, 20 abortions. And then when I saw this woman for 35, I, I, I felt that I had to go there because from what she told me, from what I read, from what I learned, the, the uh, environment was horrific. There was, ab first of all, it was illegal, but women were getting abortions and they were getting second trimester abortions, you know, on kitchen tables. And doctors were charging $3 for these abortions. And the doctors were also telling women that abortion was a lot safer than the birth control pill. Why? Because they got paid for doing abortions. Nobody was uh, delivering. The, the uh, obstetrical wards were empty. There was no birth control. They called condoms galoshes, so they couldn't use those. So my, <laughs> they were horrible. So my mission was to bring adequate birth control and also to develop an abortion facility. And I got relatively far, but because of the politics and the danger and the craziness, of what was going on at the time, it was not safe for me to continue. Um, that's why I went to Russia. At this point, I have no intention of going anywhere else. <laughs> I just want to remember Pussy Riot now, that's all. <laughs> Let's think about Pussy Riot. And Greenpeace. And <laughs> I think that would call the end of the, of the debate. Thank you. Thank you so much. For